Hi, I'm Jerome from Cognito Academy and today we'll be going through the Admiralty Secondary School Prelim Exam 2019 Paper 1 for Physics. Let's start off with the first question. Here we have a diagram below that shows two identical spheres placed next to each other and we are asked what the radius of each sphere is. Well, we know that we are given the ruler measurement of four radiuses here. So what we have to do here is just take 16 which is 20 minus 4 divided by 4 radiuses which is equal to 4 millimeters per radius so the answer here is P so now here we have the next question where it takes 1.5 seconds for the pendulum to swim from swing from X to Y we we'll ask how many complete oscillations there are in one minute so let's find let's recall what a complete oscillation is. The ball has to travel from x to y, then from y back to x, then from x to the left hand side and back to x. So that's four times the 1.5 seconds that was measured on oscillations. Take six seconds and so one minute which is sixty seconds, there is ten oscillations. So the answer here is A. The next question, which of the following distance time graph represents deceleration? Now deceleration is a decrease in the velocity and the velocity in a distance time graph is seen through the gradient of the graph. So a decrease in velocity means that the gradient of our graph has to decrease, has to become less steep. Here it can't be A because the gradient is the same at the start and at the end, so it's not A. B, there is a decrease we start off with a higher velocity here represented by a steeper gradient and then a lower velocity because the gradient becomes more shallow so b is correct now let's just take a look for completeness let's just take a look at c and d c and d are both straight lines same thing with a the velocity at the start and at the end is the same so the velocity doesn't change there's no deceleration here it can't be c or d Our answer for three is b Next, a stone is thrown upwards from the top of a building which Rho describes its acceleration and the velocity of the stone when it reaches maximum height. So the path of the stone goes like this, up, 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 until it stops and then it goes down, 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 down. So this is what we're talking about. So when it stops, the velocity is actually zero. So these two options are correct. Now the acceleration never changes. Uh, assuming no air resistance is always given by the gravitational acceleration which is 10 so the answer here is C an object falls from a height of 120 meters how many how much time does it take to reach the ground so we have 120 meters here and then uh, an object falls to the ground and we are asked how much time does it take so this 100 meters we can use the expression s equals to ut plus half a t squared and assuming that the object starts from rest because we're not given any info here ut is zero half a t squared is half times uh, we take a as 10 t squared uh, a is 10 because it's given by the gravitational acceleration s is the distance it traveled to fall to the ground which is 120 meters so here we have 24 equals to t squared and t equals to 4.9 so the answer here is a the following diagram shows all the horizontal forces acting on a moving truck and we are asked which of the following best describes the motion of the truck the truck will stop, it will move to the right, it will move to the left, it will accelerate to the right or the left we are not told whether the truck is moving initially in which direction first we are just given the forces and then here we have a resultant force of sorry 700 newtons because we have 500, 500 and then 300 so the resultant force is 700 newtons and then we are asked to de describe the motion of the truck so the truck will accelerate to the right is correct the answer here is D now why can't it move to the left or move to the right or stop because we are not told what the initial movement of the truck is it could be, ex it could be moving to the right at first and then uh, 
after that it accelerates to the right so it's still moving to the right but or it could be moving to the left and then because there's a net force here then the truck is actually decelerating or accelerating to the right which is the same thing or it stop it will stop we don't know we really don't know because we're not told the initial uh, motion of the truck so all we can tell is that it will accelerate to the right The diagram below shows how the weight varies with mass on planets P and Q. An object weighs 400 newtons on planet P. The object is then taken to planet Q, which is the following. Which of the following is correct? And we are given the mass of the object and the weight of the object. And here, what we want to do is find that because the object weighs 400 newtons on planet P, we actually know the mass of the object. And note that the mass of the object is it doesn't change it's independent of the gravitational force or which planet it is on basically so the mass will always be 40 so 40 these two op is one of these two options now next the weight is of the 40 object mass on planet Q can be conveniently taken from the graph here which is 200 newtons so the answer here is A Here, yeah, a small box of mass 2 kg moves along a track as shown in the figure. The speeds of the objects at point A and B are 4 seconds, 4, milli 4 meters per second and 1 meters per second respectively. The total distance between A and B is 2.5 meters, so this is the total distance. Alright, and we are asked what the average friction acting on the box is as it moves from A to B. So here, what we want to do is uh, use conservation of energy actually. So the energy at the start is equal to the energy at the end. And the energy at the start, let's just take this as base. So we only count the increase in gravitational potential energy here, which is 0 0.4 meters. So we have the energy at the start, which is half mv squared is equals to the energy at the end so this is the initial velocity the energy at the end half mv the next the final velocity squared plus the increase in gravitational potential energy plus the energy loss to friction and this half mv squared is uh, half half 2.0 v is 4.0 which is uh this is the same as 4 or oh, 4.0 squared which is the same as 16.0 joules equals to here yeah, half mv1 squared v1 is 1.0 so it's half times 2 times 1.0 squared plus mgh which is 2.0 that's m g let's take it to be 10 and h is 0 0.4 because that's the increase in our height and this thing at plus e friction which is the energy loss to friction so here we have 1 plus this thing is uh, 8 joules plus e friction so rearranging this, the energy we lost to friction is equals to 16 joules minus 9 which is 7 joules and remember energy is our average work energy lost to friction or work done by friction against our box is the average force so the average force which is what we're looking for times the distance that it acted upon which here we are given is 2.5 meters so this is 7.0 joules and then f is just 7.0 divided by 2.5 and this is 2.8 so our answer here is a in the diagram below the uniform meter rule is pivoted at x and held up at the point y by a rope so we have a force here and then we have the weight of the ruler in the center assuming that it is uniform and then we are asked that given the weight of the meter rule is 4.0 so this is 4.0 calculate the tension in the rope basically this force 
that is needed to ensure that the rule stays horizontal stays horizontal meaning that is in equilibrium so being e equilibrium we can use the e principles of moment yeah we can use moments basically the clockwise moments is equal to the anti-clockwise moment about any point here we also have a force acting here but to simplify things let's just take the moments about this point so we don't have to consider the force directly all we have to consider is the tension from the rope and the weight of the ruler itself now this distance because this is assuming a meter rule has its center of gravity at the 50 cm mark this distance is 45 cm and then this distance is 95 minus 15 which is 80 cm so we have 80 times our unknown force which gives us our clockwise moment is equal to our weight 4.0 times 45 cm here which gives us our anti-clockwise moment so f is just 4 times 45 over 80 and that is 2.3 an object is slightly displaced by an external force when the external force is removed the object returns to its original position what state of equilibrium is the object in this is a stable state we can think so let's try to visualize this if the words were a bit confusing so the object is slightly displaced so maybe it's displaced here and then when the external force is removed it goes back to its original position that is the definition of a stable equilibrium going through question 11 two blocks are stacked on top of one another on a table and then we are told that the weight of the top block is Q so weight of the top block is Q the weight of the bottom block is R and the base area of the top block is x and then the base area of the top block is y or the bottom block is y we ask what the pressure acting on the table by the blocks are so pressure here remember that pressure is force applied over area over which the force is applied the area applied by the blocks on the table is only the area in contact which is y here so our pressure is over y that leaves out that rules out a and b and the pressure acting on the table by the blocks is the combined weight of the top block and the bottom block which is q plus r so the answer here is b next question four holes a b c and d are made on a uniform laminar the center of gravity of the laminar is at g g here so which of the following correctly shows the laminar hanging freely about each of the holes so very simple for it to be hanging freely about this hole you have to draw a vertical line downwards and the center of gravity has to be on the vertical equal line of action downwards from the hole so a here is correct the others the g is not hanging below the pivot point so it's not hanging freely hey, sorry the, the pivot point here is d yeah g is not hanging freely about any of these points so the answer is a the diagram shows four containers containing water or oil. Oil floats on water. What we should read from this is the density of oil is less than the density of water. And which of the container will have higher pressure at the base of the container? So the base of the pressure at some point in a liquid is rho g h and because we want to maximize the pressure at the base of the container we want to maximize rho and we want to maximize hg we can't really change on the same planet g is the same so oil floats on water means P, G, uh, rho of oil is less than rho of water so we should 
what because we want to maximize rho we should take water c and d are out and then h to maximize h we want the highest column of water above our base so the highest column here is in a the answer here is a The diagram below shows a simple hydraulic system where a 20 newton force is acting on piston P. Piston P has an area of 5 cm squared and Q has an area of 30 cm squared. 30 and 5 here. And what's the magnitude of force F? So for a, in this case for a simple hydraulic system, we have the pressure at this point of the liquid is the same as the pressure at this point of the liquid. So very simply, let's just calculate the pressure at piston P, then we'll get the pressure at piston Q, and we can divide by the area, or we can multiply by the area at piston Q to get F. So piston P, the pressure is 20 newtons over 5 cm squared, which is 4 newtons per cm squared, and then this is the same, 4 newtons per cm squared is equal to F divided by 30 cm squared so we just f equals to 4 times 30 which is 120 so our answer here is c here we have a mercury barometer and a mercury manometer this is the barometer this is the manometer a place in the same room that means the atmospheric pressure uh, is the same placed on top of a mountain okay so that means you can't just take uh, the standard atmospheric pressure because on top of the mountain the pressure will be lower the manometer is connected to a gas cylinder and we are asked what the pressure of this gas is so here we must know that there's pressure acting from the atmosphere which we can measure through the barometer and there is pressure acting by this column counteracting the pressure of the gas so those two pressures are equal let's try to find the pressure atmospheric pressure first this is 70 minus 10 which is 60 millimeters of mercury and the pressure from this column is 60 minus 25 that is 35 so the total pressure is 35 plus 60 which is 95 millimeters of mercury the answer is d the diagram shows a thermal couple when junction x and y are placed in melting ice and liquid at 35 degrees celsius respectively melting ice is just zero degrees celsius that's all they want to say from that what is the voltmeter reading when junction x is replaced junction x is here replaced by boiling water at 100 degrees celsius so han they, they want to change this to boiling water and we, we are asked what the voltmeter reading would be so remember that the potential difference divided by our difference in temperature for is the same throughout okay so the first vo the first uh, potential difference and temperature difference we have is plus 1.50 over uh, let's just take y minus x and be consistent about it so 35 minus 0 which equals to the second one which we're trying to find again y minus x 35 minus 100 so v2 is equal to 35 minus 100 is 65 or negative 65 by the way so it's negative 65 times 1.50 over 35 and the answer here let me just put it in my calculator 1.5 over 35 that is 2 negative 2.79 so the answer is A question 17 which diagram represents the change in arrangement of the particles of water when it freezes so freezes is changing from liquid 
too solid. So liquid, we have a close but not regular arrangement of the particles. So it can't be A or B because they are regular. What we want is something like the start of C or D. And then to solid, solid becomes the close regular arrangement of the particles of water. So the answer here is D. The diagram shows a container used to keep warm food for delivery. So here is warm, then outside is cool, and then any heat transfer goes from the inside to the outside. So which of the poor following explanation is correct? Plastic is a poor conductor of heat. Yeah, this is correct. Hence heat loss will be reduced through conduction. Yes, this is correct. So A is correct but we are looking for something that's incorrect and A is not what we're looking for. Plastic cover reduces the formation of convection currents preventing the cooling of food contents in the container. That's right. If the plastic cover wasn't there then the air will be able to freely travel in and out forming convection currents uh, yeah, and cooling the warm food down. So the plastic cover does reduce the formation of convection currents even though there might be convection currents within the plastic container itself. This is correct which makes it not the option we are looking for. Next, vacuum reduces heat loss due to conduction as it does not have a medium to transfer the heat. That's right, conduction can only happen through a medium. So C is correct, which makes it not the answer we are looking for. The answer is D. Black inner walls is a poor absorber of infrared radiation. This is wrong. Black is a good absorber of infrared radiation. So, yeah, actually, if change, changing the black inner walls to shiny would make this container better. Here we have a hot piece of heating rod is immersed into a beaker of water and then the bubbles are observed in the water in the surface area in contact with the heating rod. Which of the following statement best explains the observation? This has nothing to do with conduction, convection or radiation. This is just the evaporation of water because the heat next to the heating rod causing the bubbles to form. I don't know if you ever boiled water but if you have you usually see at the start this is the fire by the way that there are bubbles that are formed before the water starts boiling. It's the same concept here. This surface which is the hottest evaporates the water closest to it causing the bubbles to form. So our answer here is C. Question 20. An electrical heater is used to heat a 2 kilogram piece of metal from 30 degrees Celsius to 40 degrees Celsius. It's 2 kilograms. Okay, the specific heat capacity is 720 joules per kilogram per Kelvin. The heater was turned on for 20 seconds and it's known that 20% of the energy supply is lost to the surrounding. So, what is the power rating of the heater? So let's just take the power rating and call it P times 20 seconds, which is the energy we sent to the piece of metal times 80%, which is because of the 20% loss to the surroundings. And this equals to our 2 kg times 10 degrees Celsius increase times 720 joules per kilogram per Kelvin. Kelvin, when we're doing it in intervals, Kelvin is the same as degrees Celsius. So, here, all we have to do is take P equals to 20 times 0 0.8 divided by 2 times 10 times 720. And let me put that into my calculator. 20 times 0.8. Uh, divided by 2 times 10 times 720 that gives us oh wait I messed up uh, it's the other way around P is equals to 2 times 10 times 720 over 20 times 0 0.8 
now that gives us 900 watts so answer here is C alright let's take a look at our next question here 21 two liquids P and Q of the same masses are placed in a room for cooling their cooling curves are shown in the diagram below so we have we see two plateaus here here and here for Q and here and here for P and then for Q so since the temperature here is higher this actually corresponds to uh, because it's cooling condensation and then same thing for here condensation then for here this corresponds to freezing all right so now with that in mind we are asked which of the following statement correctly describes the two liquids p and q they have the same specific latent heat of fusion well fusion is from solid to liquid and corresponds to this but we don't know because we, are, we weren't given how long it took to freeze because the graph ends when they're still freezing so we don't know that about A we can't say that A is correct P and Q have the same freezing point uh, yep they have the same freezing point because they share the same plateau here so the answer here is B P has a higher specific latent heat of fusion that Q we don't know that again fusion corresponds to this freezing line so we don't know C Q has a lower freezing point than P not true they have the same freezing point as we shown just now so the answer is B a plane mirror is inclined 40 degrees to the tabletop this angle here is 40 degrees and incident ray parallel to the tabletop strikes a mirror and a reflected ray is formed so the reflected ray is something like this probably what is the angle of reflection so remember that our angle of reflection which is this angle equals to our angle of incidence which is this angle and then from these two parallel lines we know that this is 40 and then this is the normal so this is 90 degrees so this is 50 degrees so our answer is 50 three rays of light are incident between a glass block and air the diagram is not drawn to scale so we have glass glass to air so there's refraction here by a bit then there's more extreme refraction here and then here we have full internal reflection so the critical angle is actually the angle at which this would be completely flat or the angle above which there would be full internal reflection so it has to be between 50 and 40 because for 40 there's refraction for 50 there's full internal reflection so the only option here is 45 the rest are not between 50 and 40 question 24 an object is placed 35 cm from a converging lens so let's try to draw yeah let's try to draw so we have an object this is 35 cm and we are an real image of the same size yeah and there's a real image of the same size as the object forms actually of the same size that means that this is 35 cm o as well so this is our image and So we are asked, they are told that the object is now moved closer, right? Uh, let me redraw this. Now the object is moved closer so that it's now 20 cm from the lens. And we are asked whether the new image is bigger or smaller and whether the distance from the lens the lens is greater than 35 cm one way to do is draw the diagram so we realize that uh, with the same with a, the same with a closer distance it takes further to refract so the 
object will be further away and bigger. Another way is to use our further bigger and further so the distance of the length is greater the answer here is c another way of figuring that out is by using our equation one over the distance from the object over one over the distance from the image is equals to one over the focal length of the lens now this focal length for the same lens is constant so by moving it closer, meaning we decrease this uh, O distance, this 1 over O becomes bigger. But to keep this constant, that means this 1 over I has to be smaller, meaning this 1 over I, or this I, has to be bigger itself. So, that means that I increases. So, our distance is further, our distance of our image is further from the lens. And because it's further from the lens, the image is also bigger. So the answer here is C. Next question 25. A ball floats on water in a swimming pool. When the water wave reaches the ball, how will the ball be displaced? Simply when it will just go up the wave and then down, but upwards first. So the answer here is A. Which of the following is not an application of infrared radiation? A, remote control, that's infrared. B, ear thermometer, infrared as well. C, night vision goggles, infrared as well. D, sun beds used for skin tanning. Nope, that's not infrared, that is UV. So our answer here is D. 27. The diagram shows the relationship between the frequency of electromagnetic radiation and the wavelength of the waves. So which of the following relationship can be interpreted from the graph. Remember that our V equals to F lambda. V is the velocity of the wave. F is our frequency and lambda is our wavelength. So if we have a constant velocity, we have F equals to V over lambda. We have a, sorry, V over lambda. We have a reciprocal relationship between frequency and wavelength, which is what is shown here. So if the velocity is constant, we will get this graph. So the velocity is constant. A is correct. Let's look at the other answers for completeness here. The higher the wavelength, the higher the energy of the waves. Uh, we can't really, actually, that is wrong because taking the energy, which is HF of a electromagnetic wave photon, we have the higher the frequency, the higher the energy, but the higher the wavelength, higher the wavelength, the frequency decreases, so energy will decrease actually, so B is wrong. Now, frequency is directly proportional to the energy of waves from this equation. That is technically correct, but they're asking interpreted from this graph. So C is cannot be interpreted from this graph. It only tells us the frequency and the wavelength. So nope, C is not our answer it's not wrong but it's not our answer waves of fre higher frequency travel faster than waves of lower frequency now let's look again because we have a reciprocal graph the velocity of the wave is constant so nope the frequency does not affect the how fast the wave travels or its velocity question 28 a starting pistol is fired at the start line of a race. So we have, okay, let's just draw this as, take this as the start line and the echo from a wall. So let's say this is the wall. It's heard 0 0.5 seconds later and we are given the speed of sound in air. So from the pistol, the sound has to travel from the pistol to the wall and being reflected back to the wall, right? Uh, and this whole process of traveling to the wall and traveling being reflected back takes 0 0.5 seconds. So that means the total distance it travels is 0 0.5 times 330, which equals 165. But remember that this is two distances. The sound wave traveled two distances, and we're asking the distance of one distance. So we divide by two again, which gives us 82.5. And our answer here is A. Here we are asked the electric, we are given the electric field patterns and we are asked what are the charges positive or negative. So very easy, just take 
P look at the lines are they traveling outwards away or towards the charge if they're traveling away it's positive so P is positive Q is positive R is negative and as fast as that we get our answer B question 30 a battery drives 100 coulombs of charge around a closed circuit the total work done is 750 joules what is the EMF of the battery remember that EMF is equal to the work done divided by our charge so that is just 750 divided by 100 which is 7.5 volts and our answer is C Question 31, we are given the resistance of the wire 1.0 ohms, we are given a second wire made of the same material, so the same resistivity, but twice the length, so twice the length and half the diameter. And we are asked what its resistance is, let's remember that the resistance is the resistivity times the length over the area, since the length is twice, it's double, we have uh, the length times 2 here, the area, diameter half, doesn't mean area half, diameter half because A equals 1 quarter pi diameter squared, because of this squared, diameter half means the area is 1 quarter of the original area, this gives us 8 resistance, 8 times the original resistance of 1.0, so the answer is D. Here we have a circuit, a 1.8 volt power supply is connected to a circuit consisting of three 6 ohms resistors. 1, 2, 3. These two are in series. This and these two are in parallel. What is the amount of work done by the battery in one minute? We want to find the power. We want to find the we want to find the power times 60 seconds to get the work done in one minute. So to get power we want to take the voltage or the EMF of the battery 1.8 volts squared over the effective resistance of this block and what is the effective resistance of this block we have this formula 1 over the effective resistance is equal to the reciprocal of one branch 6.0 which is this branch plus the other branch 12.0 which is these two added together because they are in series that tells us that our effective resistance is equal to 1 over 1 over 6 plus 1 over 12 which is from my calculator 4.0 ohms and so our power in this case will be 1.8 squared over 4 1.8 squared over 4 which is 0 0.81 watts or joules over seconds and times 60 seconds we have 48.6 so the answer is B Here we have an electrician that installed two switches S1 and S2 to control two lamps L1 and L2 in the following circuit. Now which of the following configuration we switch on both L1 and L2 at the same time. So L1 must be activated and so will must L2. So uh, we cannot have S1 because that will buy the current will bypass the lamp over here and there will be no current through L2 so L2 would not be lit up but we want L2 to be lit up so S1 cannot be closed so S1 must be open so that eliminates C and D S2 must be closed in order to complete this entire circuit from here to here to here to here to here lighting up both lamps so our answer is that s2 must be closed and b is eliminated as well our answer is a here we have a magnet placed on top of a paper matchbox and then it's attracting a bunch of paper clips 
and they place different metal sheets between in the matchbox between the magnets and the extracted paper clips and then we are told that when sheet X is placed inside the paper clips remain meaning that sheet X is non-magnetic and sh when sheet Y is placed instead the paper clips fell off meaning that sheet Y is magnetic so we must find a non-magnetic material for sheet X and sheet Y must be magnetic so non-magnetic that leaves out iron so C and D are out magnetic copper is non-magnetic so A is out our answer is B copper which is non-magnetic does not cause the paper clips to fall and iron which is does because it's magnetic in which of the circuits will a filament lamp be less bright if the temperature of component G decreases so we have to first know what component G is now this component G is a thermistor so with normal wires the, an increase in temperature causes an increase in resistance but not with the thermistor an increase in temperature of the thermistor causes a decrease in resistance and here we're asking if the temperature decreases so if the temperature decreases the resistance increases for the thermistor this component G here now if the so now we are asking when will the filament lamp be less bright so here a the brightness of the filament lamp will actually remain the same because the both thermistor and the lamp are arranged in parallel directly with the battery so the potential difference across the the potential difference across the lamp is the EMF of the battery whether the thermistor has a higher or lower resistance so it can't be A we want the filament lamp to be less bright now here we have the thermistor resistance increasing meaning that the potential difference across this meaning that the potential difference across this lamp will be lower another way of looking at it is that the overall resistance of these two components will increase so the current that will pass through the lamp will decrease so the lamp will be less bright B is correct for completeness let's just look at C and D here same thing the battery has the same EMF the same potential difference the EMF of the cell the brightness will remain the same it will not be option C here we have a resistor over here and the thermistor uh, resistance increases so what happens here is that let's redraw this so our lamp is here our thermistor is here and uh, don't mind the direction of the battery basically we have when the thermistor resistance increases the effective resistance of this component increases meaning that the potential difference across these two components will increase because it takes up a higher proportion of the EMF because this resistor remains the same now with the potential difference increasing the lamp will become brighter instead but our question is asking for the filament lamp to be less bright so D is wrong question 36 the diagram shows the cross section of a cable lying on the ground there's a direct current and then from the direction the current is into the plane of the paper the earth magnetic field is in this direction and in which direction does the we are asked in which direction does the EMF elect no sorry in which direction does the electromagnetic force act on the cable so 
Uh, here we just have to use our right hand rule, put our thumb in the direction into the plane of the paper. We realize that our fingers are curling clockwise. So the uh, magnetic field generated by the current is clockwise. This means that here, because the magnetic, the magnetic field from the current is in the same direction as the Earth's magnetic field, this way, here we'll have a very strong magnetic field, while here, because the magnetic field generated by the current is acting opposite to the Earth's magnetic field, there will be a weak magnetic field at this direction. So there will be a force pushing it from the a direction of stronger magnetic field to low weaker magnetic field and so the direction of the electromagnetic force acting on the cable is A. 37. The diagram shows a simple DC motors. We are asked which of the following parts is the commutator. It's just D. This part is the commutator. 38. The diagram shows a current passing from x to y, x to y, and there being an upward force on the wire. And then we are asked what happens if the direction of current reverses, so it goes from y to x instead. And if you just use your right hand rule, you realize that the force goes the opposite direction, so it goes downwards. The wire will move downwards. 39. Which of the following does not affect the magnitude of induced EMF in a simple AC generator? Speed of rotation of the coil? Nope. The speed of rotation does increase the induced EMF. The distance between the magnetic and magnet and rectangular coil? No, the distance between the magnet and the coil determines the strength of the magnetic field. So, and the magnetic field does, it does affect the magnitude of the induced EMF, so it can't be B either. The number of turns of turns of coil per unit length. So the more turns of coil there are, the higher the induced EMF, so C is wrong as well. The answer is D, the resistance of the rectangular coil. So essentially the resistance of the rectangular coil does not affect the magnitude of the induced EMF. The current might be affected by the magnitude of the induced current might be affected by the resistance but not the magnitude of the induced EMF. Question 40. Two straight electrical conductors are parallel to one another. Each contains a current, one into the plane of the paper and one out of the plane of the paper and then we are asked which diagram uh, accurately represents the magnetic field. So uh, just one thing to note is that using our uh, right hand rule you can see that this current traveling out of the plane of the paper is uh, going counterclockwise while this current traveling into the plane of the paper creates a magnetic field that goes clockwise so um, B is wrong because the direction of magnetic fields are wrong A is the, the by the right hand rule the direction of the induced magnetic fields are correct but it doesn't take into account that in the center where there's a magnetic field from here and a magnetic field from here the magnetic field should be stronger so the field lines should be closer together which they are not over here so A is also wrong. C represents what we're looking for accurately. D on the other hand has the induced magnetic field uh, induced magnetic field direction wrong for this wire. If you put your thumb in to the plane of the paper, you realize that your fingers are curling clockwise, which but here is curling anti-clockwise, so D is wrong. So answer is C. And that concludes paper one.